Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to our first session of explorations for the fall 2017 session. Um, before I introduce our speaker today, I do want to remind everybody to please fill out an evaluation uh, before you leave. Uh, leave it on the table. That will be the very appreciative. And um, our speaker next week will be Katrina Boverman doing some guided meditation. Um, and I think that's basically all the announcements. So, without anything else, I will introduce our speaker today. I know a lot of you know is Miss Donna Peterson. She is a docent at the Dr. Mudd House that some of you joined me on a trip there recently. Um, and she is here to talk about women in the Civil War. And as I always say, she knows much more about herself, so I will let you tell her, uh, tell you about her, and we'll go from there. Thank you, Karen. Hey, okay, I don't welcome. think I need Thank that. Yeah. That well, uh, a lot of you know me. Um, my love of history start. well, it didn't really start at Dr. Mudd, but it certainly got a boost. I, history was the only subject I got A's in in school so um, it's been uh, it's been a great um, uh, adventure for me to be at the Dr. Mudd Museum and everything that goes with it this project started when one of my fellow docents at the Dr. Mudd house he's a, a reenactor a Civil War reenactor and he, he I call him a cross-dresser because he he plays a Civil War um, he plays a Confederate general and a Union general so, hence, a, a cross-dresser. And he has, he's so enthusiastic, just like I am, and he put in, we gave him a corn crib, what they call an old corn crib uh, on the farm, and he has turned it into a Civil War museum. Uh, from his perspective, because his father, a great-grandfather, was in the Civil War, and uh, his name was General Presley, uh, related to someone else from Tennessee. Um, so, of course, I loved him for that. But anyway, he gives a presentation called Footsteps, and it's about his family's journey from the Civil War on. And he asked me to fill in for him because he has to cross-dress. You know, he comes out as a Union soldier and blah, 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 and then he goes, and I'll be right back. So he goes and changes into his other uniform, and so he asked me to fill in. Well, I had a, a few women. I had, well, no, I call it my science fair project because I got those, <laughs> those bifold things, you know, and put Dr. Mudd's picture and, you know, all the principles in, in the uh, Dr. Mudd story. And so when I told my daughter about it, she goes, Mom, come into the 21st century and make a PowerPoint presentation. I said, a what? <laughs> so she helped guide me through this. And... I started researching women in the Civil War, and what did I find? Fabulous stories about some. I mean, it's overwhelming. I've got 75 right now. Of course, I can't talk about everybody, you know, in, in one day. So um, I first had it in three lectures. Then I spoke at the Golden Agers, and I gave them lecture one. So for you that saw my uh, presentation, there's going to be a couple of um, different ones. I mean, the same ones. But I have found a whole new, um, new people and new, new things to talk about. And only, and this is only less, less, uh, session one. When I present for the next time I get invited back, um, <laughs> I'll have session two, and that's equally as interesting. So, let me get started. Okay, here I am. Born to my parents in West Point, New York, and uh, we, fi we finally, well, I lived all over the world, but we finally settled in Greenbelt. I was married, had two children, lived all over the D.C. area, um, and I answered an ad that was put in the paper by Dr. Mudd's granddaughter, and it said, be a docent at the Dr. Mudd house. I'm thinking, what's a docent? So I found out, and it's been a wonderful journey ever since women in the Civil War. Look at those beautiful dresses. Now, the first people I'm going to, the first women I'm going to speak about are women of Port Tobacco. Uh, Rose O'Neill Greenhow was related to Ellen O'Neill Cutts. That was her sister. 
and Ellen O'Neill Cutts was married to James Madison's nephew and her daughter, uh, Ellen O'Neill Cutts' daughter, married uh, Stephen Douglas. It's like people think they have, you know, things today, forget it. These are all related. And then I put Sarah Frances Dyer Mudd, who is my Dr. Mudd's wife. She wasn't from Port Tobacco, but I, I put her in anyway. <laughs> so, Rose O'Neill Greenhow, what a, what a story this is. She was a Confederate spy. Her husband was an attorney, and, or I mean a physician, and she became a leading hostess in D.C. And, and during, before pre-Civil War and during the war, they still maintained their social uh, status uh, despite all the uh, battles going on. Um, and she became a confidant to powerful figures in D.C. And uh, she had been asked towards the end of the war the Confederate spy group that was based in Montreal, they asked her to go to England to raise funds. And she did. She was in jail for a while, but when she got out, she went to England and uh, she got the gold, but she was so nervous about um, having traveling with the gold, she sewed it into her clothes. And so she's on the ship approaching um, Norfolk and uh, they see another, a Union gunship, and she panicked, and she took a small rowboat, and she went and got in the rowboat, and the rowboat kind of fell apart, and unfortunately she sank because of all the gold in her clothes, and she drowned. Uh, because, and, but you know what, they were able to recover that money. <laughs> They were able to connect, yeah, to, the Confederates got it, yeah, they got it back. Um, and she, <laughs> she was honored with a Confederate military funeral. Now, there is so much to tell about her, but I, you know, I can't stop and tell you all, but if you ever want to look her up, she's just a fascinating lady. Anna Olivia Floyd. She was described as the most famous Confederate blockade runner. She had a home in Port Tobacco that was known as Rose Hill. And early on, the Union soldiers took over her home. But she thought she'd use it to her advantage because she would entertain them. But once they went up to their rooms, she would go to Later's Ferry, which is in Port Tobacco, where she relayed the secrets that she heard them talking about uh, in the living room. And the Confederates were then carried across the Potomac to Virginia. And at one point, she was purported to have $800,000 in her home for the Confederates to use. And there was a bounty on her head for her capture, but she never was prosecuted, but she died a spinster at her beloved Rose Hill. Ellen O'Neill Cutts, the daughter of John O'Neill. They had originally, the girls had originally been born in Montgomery County. And her father, John O'Neill, bought this uh, farm in uh, Port Tobacco. And they were only there a few years where he was supposed to be murdered by one of his slaves. So when that happened, her mother uh, took her and her sisters back to D.C., and that's where they were raised. But like I said, she was uh, married James Madison Cutts, who was the nephew of James and Dolly Madison and uh, the mother of Adele, uh, who married Stephen Douglas, and also he was one of Mary Lincoln's uh, suitors, and she was a socialite during the war. Sarah Frances Mudd died. Sarah Frances Dyer Mudd. She was uh, the wife of Dr. Mudd. Uh, they were childhood sweethearts, and he, she went away to school. She went to Visitation Academy in Frederick, Maryland, which is now part of Hood College. Um, and she graduated from there. And upstairs in the, what we call the Booth Bedroom, we have a picture that she painted in 1852, and it was called Sleeping Beauty. And it really is the focal point of the room. Um, as a wedding present, a do the, Dr. Mudd's family was so proud of him. Dr. Mudd was one of 10 children, and they were so proud of him. His father gave him, as a wedding present, the house and 200 acres. And they had nine children. After Dr. Mudd's arrest, she worked very hard, tirelessly, to convince Andrew Johnson to issue a pardon. 
uh, which he did right before he was impeached in 1869. Um, but it was the, actually the yellow fever epidemic that really got him out of prison. Now, there were Jewish women in the Civil War. Um, Octavia Harvey Moses, Rosanna Dyer Osterman, Eugenia Phillips, Septima Marie, Maria Levi Collis, and Phoebe Levi Pember. Um, Octavia was born in South Carolina, and she married a Jewish man, had 17 children. Yes, her father was one of the founders of a Reform Judaism in America, and she and her family offered relief to the Confederate soldiers by knitting socks, and this is interesting, preparing lint for dre uh, dressing wounds and sent blankets to uh, supply centers. She also cut up her curtains, not unlike who? Yeah. Scarlett O'Hara, um, uh, to make dresses. Um, and this was so interesting. She made imitation coffee from okra seeds and parched peanuts and hats from corn shucks. So she tried to meet every train bringing the soldiers into her town so they made sure she, they had the provisions they needed. And this help extended to Union soldiers as well. Uh, she had a son that went into the Civil War, and unfortunately he died the same day Robert E. Lee surrendered at Appomattox. He was the last Confederate Jew to be killed in battle, and at age 80 she wrote her memoirs. Rosanna Dyer Osterman, now she was an immigrant from Germany, and she settled in Baltimore uh, at first, her family did, and they built the first synagogue there. Uh, she got married young, moved to Galveston, where her husband opened a store. And when the Civil War broke out, uh, the troops blocked the city, businesses closed. But by then, she was a childless widow and opened her home as a hospital. Uh, she also acted as a courier uh, of military info to the Confederate soldiers in Houston. And I would never have thought about the war being fought in Houston. Um, but unfortunately, she didn't live a long life. She died in 1866, uh, where she drowned after an explosion on a steamship. But she left her estate of over 200,000 to various Jewish hospitals. Phoebe Levi Pember. She was another uh, prominent Jewish family from South Carolina. She was a nurse, and she was the administrator of the Chimborazo Hospital in Richmond during the Civil War and they eventually cared for over 15,000 patients during the war. She married a Bostonian, I don't know where she met him, but um, he was not Jewish, um, and he died shortly after their marriage, and she too was a childless widow, but devoted herself to the cause. And uh, by the end of the war, they said her hospital had served over 76,000 patients. Her memoir was published in 1879, and it's called A Southern Woman's Story, Life in Confederate Richmond. Eugenia Phillip, another Charleston lady, a prominent Jewish family. She uh, was married to Philip Phillips, uh, who was an attorney, then a congressman, and it, they moved to Washington. And unbeknownst to him, his wife sided with the South and joined Rose Greenhow, who was her next door neighbor, and joined the Confederate spy group. And in 1861, he finally became aware of his wife's activities when the police came to their house and arrested everybody. <laughs> okay, they were soon asked to leave Washington, but that's okay, they moved to Richmond where she continued her spy activities and even visiting President Davis's home where she supposedly gave him maps and, and plans she smuggled out of Washington. S they soon left Richmond, went to New Orleans, um, and she was arrested on the street for laughing at, well, and, but they perceived it as her laughing at a Union funeral procession, uh, which she denied, but General Benjamin Butler uh, imprisoned her on a mosquito-infested ship island in the Gulf of Mexico probably not far from Fort Jefferson where Dr. Mudd was. She spent several months there, but finally her husband got her released. Uh, she was very ill, and they fled to the safety of Confederate territory, but they were never heard from again, and her death was never revealed. 
Septima Maria Levi Collis, she, another one in Charleston uh, uh, from a prominent Jewish family, um, but she ended up marrying a union, uh, a union man, a non-Jewish immigrant from Ireland, and he was a soldier who uh, was promoted to uh, major general. So they made their life, uh, what made their life so unusual was that her husband's high rank gave her the opportunity to be on the front lines and she met Generals Grant and Meade and engaged in a private meeting with President Lincoln. Okay, now this is a big long story. The women that John Wilkes Booth loved. First one, Maggie Mitchell. She was an actress born in New York, known for her multiple roles. And in Cleveland, she was so popular, they called, her, it, they called it the Maggie Mitchell craze. And she was admired by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow and Abraham Lincoln. She married multiple times, had one son who became a musical comedy director for Flo Ziegfeld. And she had a notorious affair with John Wilkes Booth during their many shows together. Look, she's kind of cute. Okay, Lucy Hale. Oh, my goodness. This was the daughter of um, a senator from New Hampshire. And John Wilkes Booth worked his wily ways into her life. And uh, you can see she was, you know, kind of a little chubby and probably was... Um, uh, very, you know, here John Wilkes Booth was reported to be the most handsome man in the United States and they became secretly engaged and he said that he was able to go to the second inauguration of President Lincoln because she got him tickets and so he said at that time, there's a picture of him, you know, it's kind of iffy whether it's him but people are, you know, <coughs> the historians said, yeah, it's him, uh, but he said he could have had a clear shot at him then. So, um, but her, her next claim to fame was that her picture was one of five <laughs> that John Wilkes Booth had in his wallet. Um, but her father scurried her out of the country immediately because, God forbid, the scandal. Uh, she ended up getting married to a lawyer, William Chandler. Uh, he became Secretary of the Navy, and she became immersed in the D.C. Society. And her grandson became a highly decorated naval admiral during World War II. Effie German, another uh, actress uh, from Georgia. Um, she uh, started acting at 12, but she, and she was married multiple times, but no record of having any children. She was known as a sabrette, always playing the coquettish role or frivolous young woman in comedies but best known for her photograph being among the five of John <laughs> Wilkes Booth uh, after killing Lincoln. Now here's another interesting fact. She was performing at Grover's Theater in Washington, not far from uh, Ford's Theater. Uh, she was uh, in Aladdin, and guess who was in the audience? Tad Lincoln. Mm -hmm. And it was then that they came and got him when after his father had been assassinated but that's where uh, Tad was. Isabel Sumner, now she's a cute little thing isn't she? 16 years old, met Booth while he was playing in Boston and he wrote her letters and brought her a pearl ring inscribed JWB to IS. Ooh, And he would send letters not to her parents home but she was at 16 she was smart enough to get a, a post office box <laughs> to uh, get his letters. They met once in New York City uh, when Booth was sick in New York. He had had surgery on the side of his neck and so she, she uh, <laughs> went down there to console him. Um, but after the assassination there was no evidence that the romance lasted beyond 1864. And this is a picture of, that he, gave, he gave her this one picture, it's both sides. But look at that dude, you know, giving her this, here I am, Isabel, and he signed it, J.W. Booth. How, was, how old was he at that time? Uh, he was, in 64, he was 25. Oh. So, yeah, he was, he was a guy, you know. He signed the back. Uh, Fanny Brown, uh, this is another one, American stage actress. Uh, one of the five pictures found in Booth's wallet. 
and um, she had been acting since she was six years old, married a number of times, but was considered one of the loveliest women on the stage. And these are two others that I haven't fully investigated, but these are the two remaining girls that were in his wallet. But boy, wasn't he a devil. <laughs> okay, this is a real good one. Kate Warren. She was the first female detective in the Pinkerton Agency. Um, she responded to uh, a, an ad in the paper that Pinkerton put in, but he said, uh-uh, you're a woman, we can't do that. But she persuaded him by saying women can go where men can't to spy. So there were, the first case that he gave her was an embezzlement case where she recovered 39000 of the 50000 that were stolen. So he ended up uh, giving her a job, uh, making her the, uh, in charge of the newly formed Female Detective Bureau. And she was also on the case protecting Lincoln when he came through Baltimore on his first inauguration. Uh, there was a lot of talk of assassination back then. Uh, so she was there posing, with, uh, posing as his sister. Uh, unfortunately, she did not live a long life. She died in January of 1866 from pneumonia, the same thing Dr. Mudd died from. You know, no antibiotics back then. But wow, couldn't she have had a fabulous career had she gone on? Um, to live. Harriet Cushman, another actress. Her picture wasn't in Booth's wallet though, uh, but he probably knew her. You know, they, were, they all knew each other. Um, she was born in New Orleans, but raised in uh, Michigan, and uh, she was a union spy, and she was able to steal and conceal uh, battle plans and drawings in her shoes, was discovered, put on trial, uh, sentenced to death, uh, but the hanging was postponed due to an invasion of the Union troops. <laughs> Phew, that was a close one. Then she returned to the South in a male Union uniform. That's how she was able to get through the lines. And she was awarded the rank of Brevet Major <clears throat> and made um, an honorary major by President Lincoln. Now, I looked up Brevet Major. That means they're paid the same as a real major, but... Uh, or they're given the title of major, but they don't make the money uh, that a real major would make. Um, she, uh, by the end of the war, she had been touring the country giving lectures about her exploits as, as a spy, married three times, had three children, but she then was buried with full military honors by the Union Army. Hattie Lewis Lawton, she was another one that got in with Pinkerton uh, and again, uh, she said, I'll do it for you. I can worm out secrets. And uh, she traveled throughout the South with another Pink Pinkerton operative, John Scoble, who was an African-American who posed at her, as her servant. Uh, she worked closely with Kate Warren, and together they were credited with getting Lincoln through Baltimore. Uh, she was included in numerous books written about the uh, Pinkerton Agency. Belle Boyd. Now this one is so funny. She is self-proclaimed the Cleopatra <laughs> of secession. Now she may have been the most famous female spy, but her notoriety is not due to her spy success, but to her love of publicity and fame, areas that most spies try to avoid. Uh, although, and this is funny, although not blessed with a pretty face, she used her feminine wiles to her advantage and was known for the best looking ankles. <laughs> she was credited by Stonewall Jackson for being a force that contributed his victory at Front Royal. Uh, she was arrested, sent to prison, and on the way to Baltimore, she made her no loyalty known by waving a Confederate flag out the window in every train, uh, in every town the train went through. Um, after multiple arrests, she ended up at the old Capitol prison, who was, uh, she, uh, Rose O'Neill Greenhow was also there at the same time. But continuing her flamboyant ways, she sang Dixie at the top of her lungs while she was in prison. Uh, she married three times, wrote two books, uh, went on speaking tours, but her love of fame superseded her abilities as an effective <laughs> spy. She passed away while on tour in 1900 in Wisconsin. And when you look at her, um, you know, she's got kind of got a, uh, she's not so bad. Yeah, she's not that ugly. So, Sarah Emma Edmonds. Now, this was a Canadian woman 
who came down into the United States and served as a man in the Union Army. Her excellent master of disguise led her to being a very successful spy. Uh, her exploits were described in a book, Nurse, Soldier, Spy. And in 1992, she was inducted into the Michigan Women's Hall of Fame. Uh, she ran away and she wore men's clothes because she said it was easier to eat, travel, and work independently. Uh, she enlisted in Company F in the Michigan Infantry. Uh, she served as a male nurse under McClellan's campaign in Richmond. Uh, but, and she took the name of Franklin Thompson. She traveled into en enemy territory and she once used silver nitrate to turn her skin black to look like a black man. Unbelievable. Uh, her career came to an end, as a spy, can, uh, came to an end when she contracted malaria. And while she was sick, she saw that she was listed as a deserter, which really upset her. So she dropped the female disguise rather than be shot as a runaway, I mean the male disguise, and sh uh, rather than be shot as a runaway and donned a female persona to be a nurse in Washington. Uh, she had someone publish her book. She married in 1867. She had three children who all died, so she adopted two sons. She later lectured on her experience, did receive a pension, and cleared her name as a deserter to get a, an honorable discharge. She died in 1902, buried with full military honors in the Grand Army of the Republic section of the cemetery in Michigan. Sarah Slater. Now this was, she, there's not much known about her, but she was a Confederate spy who worked with John Wilkes Booth and John Surratt and was a frequent visitor to the Surratt boarding house there on H Street. Uh, federal investigators pursued her and she uh, often gave different names, but she was identified as the French woman or the lady in the veil. Now her last known mission was April 1st, 1865 and it was to bring money intended f to fund the Confederate spy group in Montreal and bring it to London for use after the war. Slater met with Booth in Washington one last time on April 4th. After that, she and the money were never seen again. Uh -huh. Nancy Hart Douglas. She was a spy, a scout uh, for the Confederacy. She hated the Union. Um, she joined the CSA and continued to spy under Stonewall Jackson. She was a southern girl. She was born in North Carolina, moved to Tazewell, Virginia. Uh, her sympathies always were for the South. She learned how to operate a gun, handle a horse, and early in the war her family was targeted by Union troops and a close friend was killed by soldiers which fueled her rage. Uh, she later joined the Rangers was captured by Union troops, taken prisoner, but later escaped. She became so notorious that a bounty was put on her head. No mention was made about her escape. And after the war, she married a fellow ranger, and they had two sons. Mary Bowser. She was an American former slave that became a Union spy during the Civil War. She had worked for Elizabeth Van Lu, who was a wealthy lady in, uh, in Richmond. And uh, Elizabeth put her as a servant in the Jefferson Davis house so she could get the secrets of the war uh, and being a very part, uh, important part of the spy ring. After the war, she worked as a teacher to former slaves, later founded a freedman's school in Georgia. And the government did honor Ms. Bowser for her work in the Civil War and was inducted into the Military Intelligence Hall of Fame in Fort Huachuca, Arizona. Elizabeth Van Lu, known as Crazy Bet. Uh, she was a Richmond abolitionist and philanthropist who built and operated an extensive spy ring uh, for the United States. She was a Quaker and uh, she was caring for Union soldiers and when uh, the Libby prison was open in, in Richmond she aided in, for prisoners with clothing and paper. She helped them escape, passing information, uh, recently captured prisoners gave her information on the Confederate troop levels and she was able to pass this on to the Union commanders. Her spy ring was called the, the Richmond Underground and she was so successful that on several occasions she sent General Grant fresh flowers 
and a copy of the Richmond newspaper. When she died, she purportedly was buried vertically facing north. <laughs> Sally Pollock, a Maryland girl. She was born in Cumberland. Um, during the war, her city became occupied by Union uh, troops, and at 14, she started her activities as a Union, uh, Confederate spy. Uh, she carried letters past Union pickets uh, because they wouldn't think a little girl would do that. And she was quite successful until her arrest in 1864. Um, and in her possession were letters addressed to General Lee and President Davis, uh, dated March 24, 1864. Um, some, uh, some of the were upcoming plans of General Grant. Some included personal letters, some romantic in nature. She pleaded not guilty at her trial, and she was described as a bright, sunshiny kid, but was found guilty. And they put her in jail in the Pennsylvania State Penitentiary in Pittsburgh until the war was over. But after serving only seven weeks, she was released by Secretary Edwin Stanton. That's amazing, because he usually didn't do that. But one of the conditions was that she carry no more messages for the Confederacy. So she went on to have two husbands and numerous children. Doctors. Rebecca Davis Lee Crumpler. She was the first African-American woman to become a physician. She was employed as a nurse um, until she was accepted at medical school. And when the war broke out, she had to quit, go back to nursing, but resumed her education when the war ended. She married another doctor who had served with the Union Army during the war. And her publication of A Book of Medical Discourses in 1883 was the first written by an African-American African about medicine. Dr. Elizabeth Blackwell, she was another immigrant who was born in England, uh, came here to medical school, became a doctor. Her and her sister both became doctors, uh, trained women to be nurses to work in Union hospitals, and she was a pioneer in promoting education for women and a social reformer here and in the UK. Oriana Moon Andrews, um, she was born in Virginia she studied at uh, the Female Medical College of Pennsylvania. In 1861, she was tending to the soldiers, and she had hoped to become a surgeon at the University of Virginia, where the Confederacy had been. She met and married another physician, Dr. John Andrews, and she put on her career on hold, eventually having eight children together, and the demands of having children and a domesticity life uh, she, it was, and it was combined with people's general distrust of women doctors. She had one doctor that said to her, women should not dream of entering the ranks of the medical profession. She reluctantly kept nursing during the war, but established with her husband a, a medical practice in Arizona. Dr. Mary Walker, she was an American feminist. She always wanted to dress like a man. And she, in, as of 2017, she's the only woman ever to receive the Medal of Honor. <clears throat> she earned her medical degree in Syracuse, uh, married, uh, I, I don't know if she married another doctor, but she got married and mar started a medical practice. She volunteered for the union um, and served as a surgeon, even though women were considered unfit for service. She was captured by the Confederacy. Uh, she was arrested as a spy. She was sent to Richmond as, as a POW. But after the war, she was approved for the highest decoration of bravery. And she always uh, fought the norms for women, including dressing in men's clothes, refusing to say obey at her wedding vows, and retaining her middle na uh, maiden name. She eventually divorced her husband due to his infidelity. <laughs> Esther Hill Hawks. She was another physician, teacher, suffragette, and she became the antithesis of Southern womanhood. Even though she was raised in New Hampshire, she was educated as a teacher, but after meeting her husband, Dr. Hawks, she decided to study his medical books and soon graduated from medical school to become one of the first female doctors in America. Um, she was a committed abolitionist and treated black soldiers uh, from Massachusetts. Thereafter, she spent her days educating black soldiers and their family, 
and kept a diary of her experience and started the first integrated school in Florida. Nurses. Emma Green, if anyone ever watched the PBS series Mercy Street, this was based on her life. She originally had pro-union sympathies, but increasingly sided with the South as the war progressed. And her home was taken over um, by the, um, by the, the um, Confederates, and um, no, by the Union. And she became, during that time, she became a Confederate spy and uh, along with her husband, and they went after the war. So you, if you want to see more about her, watch Mercy Street. Louisa May Alcott, uh, she, we know her as an author, but she was born in Pennsylvania, but uh, her family then moved to uh, Massachusetts. But she felt the need to help out, so she came to Washington to sew clothes and to nurse the wounded soldiers, but she contracted typhoid and was treated with mercury, which affected her for the rest of her life. And however, recent analysis of her illness suggests she may have suffered from lupus. But uh, before the war ended, she went back, she was so sick, she went back to Massachusetts and started writing. And she <coughs> was published in Atlantic Monthly. And she eventually wrote the bestseller, Little Women. Uh, she never was married, uh, but she suffered from chronic illnesses, including vertigo, but died of a stroke two days after her father's own death. And in 1940, she had a commemorative five-cent stamp issued. Hannah Ropes, another New Englander. Uh, she was born to wealthy parents and had strong religious belief and was certainly opposed to slavery. Married with four children, but her husband deserted her. So she raised them by herself, became a nurse, headed to Washington during the war to help the soldiers. She ultimately became head of matron of the Union Hospital in Georgetown and changed the deplorable condition that it was in. And one of her nurses was Louisa May Alcott, who wrote the book Hospital Sketches about her experiences there. And she died of typhoid in, uh, at the age of 53. Sally Tompkins, called the Angel of the Confederacy. She was a humanitarian, a nurse, a philanthropist. Many believe she was the only woman officially commissioned by the Confederate Army. Uh, but under her supervision, they had the lowest death rate of any hospital. Uh, she was born in the Tidewater area of Virginia. She and her sister studied at the Female Institute. After that, they moved to Richmond, not knowing that Richmond would become the epicenter of the Civil War. She worked tirelessly to aid uh, the soldiers. And even after Richmond was evacuated in 65, she was able to keep the hospital open uh, to help the injured. She became a local hero for her <coughs> efforts. And upon her death, she was uh, buried with full military honors. And there are still monuments dedicated to Captain Sally. Clara Barton, everybody knows Clara Barton. Born in New England, a family of eight, she, uh, she supplemented her early education with a variety of jobs. She eventually settled in Washington just as the war broke out and saw the need to help wounded soldiers. She left the city for the field hospitals, ending up in Antietam, where overworked surgeons were using corn husks for bandages. They erected a memorial in Antietam to her memory and her nursing career took off from there. And in 1880, she established the American Red Cross. Mary Ann Ball Bickerdyke. She was known as Mother Bickerdyke. She was a hospital administrator for the Union soldiers and a lifelong veteran, a lifelong advocate for veterans. Uh, she established field hospitals, served as a lawyer assisting the vets and their families and obtaining their pensions after the war. She was from Ohio. She married Robert Bickerdyke and had two sons. Uh, when her husband died in 1859, she moved to Galesburg. And the reason I put that in was because my brother used to live in Galesburg. <laughs> <laughs> so I wanted to put that in for him. She served in the Civil War. Um, she uh, really worked with the Sanitary Commission to clean up all the hospitals to stop the spread of disease. Now, when sent to Vicksburg to work with General Grant, she sometimes deliberately ignored military procedures for the sake of the soldiers. 
The staff complained to Grant, and he threw up his hand, saying, she outranks me. I can't do a damn thing. <laughs> General Sherman called her one of my best generals. <laughs> now, what did women do in the Civil War? Everything. They provided moral, material, monetary, medical, social, and uh, spiritual guidance. Uh, they, were, they did anything they could to be essential to the cause. Okay, here comes a good one. <laughs> Teresa Bagioli Sickles. She was born in New York uh, to a well-known singing teacher, Antonio Bagioli. She met her future husband, Dan Sickles, when she was a child. He was quite a bit older than her, but he was living with and was mentored by her grandfather, Lorenzo DuPont, who was a New York University professor and father to Teresa's mother. Despite their objections, she married Sickles when she was uh, 15. He then became a New York senator, then a U.S. representative. They moved to Washington in 1856, and he was very influential, and she was a beautiful and charming hostess. Now, Rep Representative Sickles was a notorious womanizer and seriously neglected his marriage. Lonely, Teresa started having her own affairs. She met Philip Barton Key, a U.S. District Attorney and son of Francis Scott Key, author of The Star-Spangled Banner. They flaunted their affair all over Washington, even renting an apartment for their assignations. When Sickles discovered this, he was enraged, and when confronted, Teresa came clean. Well, Sickles finally confronted Key in front of the White House, where he shot the unarmed Key twice one shot directly at his groin and one shot at his head. He died an hour later. But Sickles was acquitted <coughs> in the first use of the insanity defense. <laughs> first time ever used. He continued, uh, so, uh, and you know who his lawyer was? His lawyer was uh, Edwin Stanton. That was his attorney. So he, uh, yeah, uh-huh. Uh, so, but Sickles was acquitted, so he continued to work in Congress, <laughs> despite his, uh, you know, conviction. Well, he wasn't convicted. Um, he went to war, and at the Battle of Gettysburg, he lost his leg. But uh, he continued to go on. Therese, unfortunately, took their little daughter, Laura, and moved uh, back to New York, uh, but she unfortunately died in 1867 from tuberculosis. And when she had that baby, Laura, uh, Mary Lincoln sent her over from the White House um, a little bracelet for Laura to wear. And let's see. Okay, you know what? That's, that was the end of, of my, first, my first presentation. I thought it would last longer, but I have more. So the next time you invite me back, I'll have more, uh, more to talk about. Let me see, escape. Where have you been finding all of the information? Online and in books that I have. Um, I have a lot of books. You know, working at Dr. Mudd's, I've just been so excited about reading all about this. And a lot of the stuff I have are from my own books, but a lot of it is online as well. Yes? Did a lot of the women who worked for the South have slaves themselves? You know, that was a, na a mainstay in the South. You know, they, they, I never saw something that said, and they own slaves in any of my research, but I, I certainly found the ones that were against slavery, but nobody said they own slaves in any of the women I, I uh, was in contact with. I'm so oh, did they own property? Slaves? No, oh, the women. The women. You know what? I didn't see that. I, I didn't see that they owned anything. Now, the first lady, one of the first ladies that I had, um, Olivia Floyd, she inherited uh, Rose Hill. She was the one that kept the $800,000 at her house uh, for the Confederacy. Uh, but she, she did own that. But if she married her husband. Her husband would have owned it, yeah. Now, I thought that women doctors couldn't serve in the military, at least on the Yankee side. Well, had to serve as right, a lot of them did. Um, well, there were some that were honored, uh, you know, by, well, by the union. The well, was that the, the one that got the Medal of Honor? Yeah. Dr. Mary Walker? Yeah. Yeah. 
yeah. She, she was the only woman to get a Medal of Honor. Anybody else? Any other questions? I'm a plethora of <laughs> trivia. Ask me something. Where's Port Tobacco? It's in Southern Maryland. You go down Route 5, and um, Port Tobacco is restoring their courthouse. But when I hear Port Tobacco, I think of one of the Lincoln conspirators, uh, George Azarot, who was called a waterman. And he was from Port Tobacco. So, and they used to call him Port Tobacco. But he ended up, he was given the chore of killing uh, Vice President Johnson the same night that Lincoln was going to be assassinated. And he got drunk <laughs> and didn't do it. Uh, but there was, a big, um, there was a big conspiracy that night. I mean, this is getting off women. But there was a big conspiracy that night to not only kill Lincoln, kill Vice President Johnson, kill William Seward, and William Stanton. We never knew who was assigned to do William, uh, Edwin Stanton, but we all know who tried to kill uh, uh, Seward. He, was, um, he had been in a carriage accident that week, and he was all surrounded by bandages and a metal brace, and Lewis Powell Payne was given that chore to kill Seward. Well, when he, he got access to the house, he said he was bringing him medicine. He, you know, I'm bringing him some medicine. I got to see him. And the guard said, no, you can't. He's, he's in bed. Well, he pushed him aside and ran up the stairs. And as he's trying to stab William Seward, he keeps hearing a clink, clink. And he didn't know that he was surrounded by a metal brace because of his carriage accident earlier <laughs> in the week. So, but he did manage to get his, the side of his face. So when you see pictures of Seward after the assassination and when he was trying to buy and successfully bought Alaska, uh, you can see this face. His face always kind of drooped like this. So, just a little. <laughs> uh, a number of these women were married three times. Uh, yes. Which is, even yeah. Even today, to get rid of one, just get lot. another, you know. So I was wondering, do you think that those men died? You know, they didn't say yeah. on any of the ones, yeah. They could have been, um, they could have been widowed, but, you know, one man down, two more to go. <laughs> yes, ma'am. I'm fascinated by your costume. Well, thank uh, you. The gloves. Okay, you online. I got them online. I, there was a place in Gettysburg called um, Recollections, and it's all about antique clothing. And so I got these gloves because I saw a picture in one of my books about, you know, one of the ladies having this. This is, is something I found that I thought added a little uh, niceness to it. And I made the skirt. And here's my, here's my pantaloons, okay? <laughs> and this I got at Cracker Barrel. <laughs> So, you have several outfits. I make them all. You know, I've been at Dr. Mudd's for uh, 21 years. Mm -hmm. And um, in the first picture you saw, that was the first and only dress I ever had because of my, my figure. It's not easy for me. If I get something that fits me up here, it's too big here. So I thought, well, I'll just make a skirt and then, you know, accent everything else after that. And then I just made this snood. Um, and it was, you know, I just saw Mary Lincoln wearing something like this, so I, I made one. Any other questions? <laughs> you are too kind. You are too kind. I appreciate you all. Oh, do you have a question? Um, yeah, just a quick one. Uh, I know there's been attempts to clear Dr. Mudd's name. Right. Where has that gone? Have, have they it's it's gone down the tubes because it was um, see the problem for Dr. Mudd was that he knew Booth when when Booth showed up at his house at four o'clock in the morning he had no idea that the president had just been killed but uh, Dr. Mudd's explanation was that he had a disguise on he didn't recognize him and he was there doing his Hippocratic oath that's true uh, but he ended up Booth ended up staying twelve hours at Dr. Mudd's house. And when Dr. Mudd uh, went into Bryantown to see if they could get a carriage because uh, David Harold, the man that traveled with Booth, thought, man, he's not going to be able to, you know, ride a horse because Dr. Mudd had made a splint and made a crutch for him. And he thought he's never going to be able to go on a horse. So Dr. Mudd went in to, started to go into Bryantown. 
And when David Harold, who was with him, saw the troops all gathering, he said, uh-oh, uh, I think I'll go back. And so Dr. Mudd continued on to Bryantown, where he then heard that the president had been killed by John Wilkes Booth. So knowing that he was there, Dr. Mudd scurried back to his home. And just as he was getting back to his home, he saw Booth and Harold leaving. So I'm thinking, he's thinking, good riddance, you know. So then him and his wife thought, now what are we going to do? So he ended up t telling his cousin the next day at church, it was Easter Sunday, and George Mudd said, okay, yeah, I'll, I'll tell somebody. And George ended up not going into, into Washington until like Tuesday. So the troops didn't get out there till Thursday to talk to Dr. Mudd, which they thought Dr. Mudd was just giving Booth more time to escape. Now, Dr. Mudd knew Booth. He, he, knew, he knew of him being a Confederate spy, but he never said anything. And so that's where Dr. Mudd's complicity comes in. And he was found guilty, but he missed the death penalty. You know, eight people were put on trial. They were all found guilty. Four were given the death sentence. Four were given prison sentences. Dr. Mudd missed the death penalty by one vote. So it could have been the other way for him. But um, so he was sent to prison in the Dry Tortugas and the Mudd family, you know, were just adamant about him not, I mean, he wasn't involved in the, in the assassination, but Edwin Stanton didn't care. He was out to get blood and, and get him. So um, ultimately, Dr. Mudd was released from prison uh, three years and eight months later after uh, the assassination. And um, Dr. Mudd came back to Bryantown and uh, got his life started, but it was um, he never he never was persecuted at his ha at, at, in his area. You know, I say on my tour, you know, Dr. Mudd left a legacy of of this you know house, nine children, thirty two grandchildren, everywhere outside of Charles County. His name is Mudd. So, but it was his grandson, Dr. Richard Mudd who really spent 80 years trying to clear his grandfather's name. And ultimately, he, Jimmy Carter, Ronald Reagan, nobody would touch it because they said, no, we're going to uphold the military decision to... Uh, that area was very southern. Oh, they were, very absolutely. Southern. And Dr. Mudd was as well. And his, his wife was somehow involved in it. Dr. Mudd's, Dr. Mudd's wife? Uh -huh. Wasn't she pretty much of a... Very strong southern. Oh, she definitely was. A, they were very all, good. yeah, they were all very southern, right. southern sympathizers, yeah. And they all, all knew her. They all knew Dr. Mudd? Yeah. Well, oh, the general. Oh, yeah, yeah. They were all involved in that. Well, it was, they were like a little spy they group on their own. The well, that was Surratt. Yeah. You're thinking well, of Mrs. Surratt. 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 Yeah, Surratt. Mary Surratt. When you said rooming house, I'm yeah, thinking, yeah, yeah, that was, yeah. Surratt. Well, you know, her complicity was a little dicey, you know, because she certainly was a devout Catholic and, and um, eh, her leanings were maybe in the middle, middle ground, but her son John was a definite Confederate spy. And uh, he supposedly escaped before the assassination, went to Elmira, New York. They were looking for him, though. They were hunting him, and he eventually went to Egypt, he ended up in Rome and being a papal zouave, and somebody recognized him. So he was brought back to the United States three years later and on, put on trial, and on the same evidence that convicted his mother, they had a hung jury. So he got off. But he spent the rest of his life lecturing on, <laughs> on how to get away with murder. No, no. He, didn't, he didn't have anything to do with it. I mean, he had something to do with it, but he wasn't involved. Yes? And whatever happened to Mary Todd, the wife of Lincoln? Mary Todd Lincoln, she had a very, very sad, sad life after that. And Myra Blackwell is, was her attorney, and she's one of my next, in my next presentation. Um, Mary Lincoln was, had a lot of problems to start with. Um, President Lincoln said to her one time, Mary, if you don't calm down, you know, you're, they're going to put you in St. Elizabeth's, and, and uh, she was, the, the staff of the White House called her a hellcat mm -hmm. because she was so um, 
high strung, obstreperous, you name it, that was her. And she had reason to. I mean, she had lost uh, three sons, and then being right there witness to her husband being killed. And she certainly digressed after the assassination. Um, but she started acting weird. She left America, took Tad with her. Um, her son Robert, her oldest son Robert, did become a very successful um, man. He ended up working for the, being president of the Pullman uh, train system. And, uh, but he was worried about her. She did the same thing that Rose Greenhow did, was sewing all her stuff into her clothes. And there was at one point where she could hardly move, you know, because <laughs> She had all her jewels and everything sewn into her clothes. So Robert really um, listened to doctors and other people uh, rather than his heart and had her committed to a hospital. And Mary was just livid, you know. <sighs> oh my goodness, you thought she was bad then. Well, she finally was able to get the help from a, an, a woman attorney named Myra Blackwell. And Myra did her best and did get her released from the hospital, at which time she was never going to talk to Robert Lincoln again. Uh, she ended up having a very semi-close relationship. She became very close to her namesake, her granddaughter. Uh, they named her Mary Todd Lincoln. And she did become close, but um, she, once Tad died, that was just like the final straw. He, he, he was he was probably 18 uh, and she traveled she took him to Europe with her and that's when she sewed all the stuff into her clothes and he she took him to Europe with her but he got very sick and she came back and so she lost him at, at the age of 18 so here you are three sons gone in a, in a very um, t uh, contemptuous uh, kind of personality to start with she's on the edge she loses her third son, and then her, her only surviving son puts her in a mental institution. You know, she, she, had, she didn't have it so well. She had it early. She was in her life. She was a very southern belle, and although her mother died uh, when she was very young, and that's something her and Lincoln had in common. Uh, Lincoln's mother died when he was eight, and her mother died when she was ten, and she didn't like her stepmother, so that was always, you know, a source of controversy for her. Any other questions? No? Okay, folks. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Okay.